I'm Carol Tights. I'm the current director of the current sports medicine clinic, and I'd like to welcome everybody to the ninth Garrick Lectureship. Dr. Jim Garrick was the first director of the sports medicine division here in the Department of Orthopedic Surgery starting in 1970, and it was the first academic sports medicine program in the United States. Um, Dr. Garrick sends his regrets that he couldn't be here with us this year. Colleen Johnson, who's over here at this table, took away. <laughs> was our first clinic manager and stayed in that position until 2009. And if you watch the slideshow really carefully, there are two very old pictures of her from the early 70s. In one, she's wearing a cheerleading uniform. Anyway, you can just keep, keep watching that. Um, in any case, those of you interested in more details about the history, we have the Discovery Orthopedic Department Research Report back on the table, and those of you who haven't gotten it already, we have the history of the clinic in there. Um, we want to thank Colleen for her vision in creating, having the vision to create the Garrick Lectureship, and then also to select our wonderful corporate partners from Pacific Medical to fund this lectureship. Pacific Medical has not only funded this lectureship, but also provides arthroscopy training for our residents on an annual basis. Slides them down to Tracy, California, where they have a great time for a week um, with our faculty. There's one. Anyway, I'd especially like to recognize two of the vice presidents of Pac Med, Paul Weesey, who's right here. And and can we have, there are a lot of other people here from Pacific Medical. Could I ask them just to stand up for a minute so we can thank you? So this year our special guest is Dr. Nick Motati um, from the University of Calgary, and I'll tell you more about him in a minute. Um, first, we'd like to make note of the fact that the Sports Medicine Clinic as an orthopedic clinic, orthopedic departmental clinic, is closing this year in about two weeks. And uh, we've been a departmental clinic for 43 years, and all but two of those years were in this exact building. The beginning was downstairs, where the Husky Hall of Fame is right now, and the area that you're sitting in right now was our physical therapy facility. Prior to that, it was squash courts. Um, then we moved over to electrical engineering for two years and ended up in the current location at the uh, northeast side of this building. So on September 9th, we're going to be opening a new multidisciplinary clinic that many of you just toured uh, in the new stadium. And we're very excited to have all of our Husky team docs in one place. So we'll have physicians from orthopedics, rehabilitation medicine, and family medicine all in one place, as well as musculoskeletal radiology. And we're very excited about the opportunities that this proximity will create for us to collaborate clinically and we can all elevate each other in our clinical knowledge. And I'd like to thank our chairman, Jens Chapman, Dr. Stan Herring, who's director of musculoskeletal medicine, Joni Spiso, COO for UW Medicine Healthcare Systems, Steve Zinowitz, the CEO of University of Washington Medical Center, Jennifer Herman, I think you're here somewhere, where are you? Hi, thank you. Um, Associate Administrator for UWMC Ambulatory Care, Patty O'Leary Crutcher, are you here somewhere also? Thank you. Director of UW Medicine Sports, Spine and Orthopedic Health, and Kate Boyce, who's not here tonight for their extraordinary vision, their hard work, their patience, and their resources um, to help us realize this vision of the new clinic. We're really, really excited about it. So because we're closing off the first chapter of the Sports Medicine Clinic, um, we'd also like to take a few minutes to honor our staff and our current clinic, many of whom have worked here for many, many years, and most of whom will be moving over to the new clinic with us. So I'd like to ask Dr. Chapman to come and make a few remarks, and then we'll ask all of our current doctors to come up to help us present gifts to our physical therapists. 
So before you leave, Carol, and sit down, everybody, please raise your glasses to Carol and a salute. This whole transition would have not been possible with this colleague who started in the first sports medicine women in the world and who's now brought this into reality. Here's a toast to Carol. Thank you. 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 The sense of the importance of trying to bring this initial dream uh, that she was a part of formulating into this new era of multidisciplinary care and not be overstated. Mm -hmm. Her contribution in this um, uh, latest edition of Discoveries 2013 is a wonderful synopsis of the history of sports medicine. I really hope that all of you have not had this so far. Please uh, take a look at this in greater detail. I guess we'll pitch the cover art is yet again an in-house production by Professor Kavanaugh's dear wife uh, and Matt Neveld. And so uh, this is a really cool contribution. Thank you, Kavanaugh household, for your contribution. This is, again, a spectacular, and I welcome all of you on this beautiful uh, Northwest afternoon that we're getting really used to. So I hope global warming will not change too soon. Um, to join us here in the Founders Hall. And this is a bittersweet um, event. Um, bitter because it means the closing of a chapter in which we had our own departmental clinic, and we're now moving into a much bigger multidisciplinary hospital sphere. And any one of you who's seen the new clinic, can I have a show of hands? Who's seen this uh, new clinic space by show of hands? Pretty spectacular, I say so. It's exceeded any of my wildest dreams what has happened. But this is a new era of healthcare in which all of us work together, in which our colleagues from rehabilitation medicine, our colleagues from family are, and yes, also sports psychology, cardiology, and many others work together in a large sphere towards sports, spine, and orthopedic health, which will be like the new name for a multidisciplinary outfit, make a whole new patient care approach possible. And I want to point out that also research and sports performance, uh, legal that is, sports performance uh, uh, care will be significant elements in this uh, multidisciplinary endeavor. So this is, again, something where many people pull together and this should not take away from the individual accomplishments of so many to have brought the role of the sports clinic to this, and this is the bitter part, uh, to this kind of a culmination. So for this I'm going to ask Carol to come back to the podium, and we'd like to take this moment to really, as we're closing the old clinic, acknowledge the members of the sports medicine clinic that was under the orthopedic domain for so many years um, to the success. So whilst we have a group of Physicians stand up in recognition. We'll ask in sequence, and Carol will take the microphone here, those who've helped with this great success to come up uh, and get a small departmental recognition.
Dr. Motati continues to make significant research contributions as one of the few orthopedic surgeons in the world who has conducted randomized clinical trials. His research has compared methods of ACL reconstruction, treatment of Achilles tendon ruptures, and surgery for shoulder instability. He's actually authored a Cochrane systematic review on ACL reconstruction. And he has also studied and published on outcome measures and health services delivery. He's recently been looking at a new model of care for managing acute knee injuries. The therapist will be interested to know about uh, home PT versus in-clinic PT. It's one of the things he's been looking at. And outcome of hip arthroscopic procedures. He has 80 peer-reviewed papers, 13 books and book chapters. He's been an invited speaker at 96 venues, now 97 venues, um, and has additional over 200 presentations around the world. He's won 19 awards and has had continuous research funding for the last 15 to 17 years. Yesterday morning, Dr. Motetti spent a few hours with our residents. He was teaching them principles of arthroscopy. Um, he then did a um, cadaver arthroscopic demonstration, which the residents really enjoyed. Um, and, it was, and it was fun to see him. He did an ACL reconstruction with white yarn, actually, as a first. Um, so tonight, Dr. Motetti is going to be speaking on patient-centered care, changing the paradigm by understanding outcomes. I give you Dr. Nick Motetti. sure how to acknowledge that introduction, but I'd like to thank Carol for inviting me. I didn't think it was going to be such a big deal when she first talked to me and asked me to come here, but I realized that the tradition of University of Washington orthopedics, in particular sport medicine, goes a lot further back than most people would uh, consider. We think that we started sport medicine in Canada a long time ago, but clearly we weren't as far back as uh, this institution. I'd also like to thank everybody that has organized the trip for me, Teresa in particular. Um, she was corresponding with our clinic manager, and in Canada we have very few resources, so I'm envious of what's going on here, but um, you know, hopefully we'll will uh, be able to bring some light to what we're doing here tonight. Now, I understand that everybody's going to be eating this really good meal, so I understand a few of you will turn off. Hopefully I can get your attention. Bruce Waddle here and I have been friends for a long time, and uh, he knows that I can be politically incorrect at times, so if you're not paying attention, then you get ready for a shocking comment or two. So this title I suggested because um, it is something that I feel quite passionate about and it uses a lot of big words, so I'll try and uh, help sort that out. But I'm honored to uh, be the Jim Garrick lecturer. I've actually met him probably 20 years ago and I can recall vividly reading a lot of his research, and we do have some things in common. So this is a quote from what I got from Google and about Jim, and this is when he was first here at the University of Washington, and how he acknowledged what he learned from the head athletic trainer at the time. And I've had a very close relationship with our athletic trainers, we call them athletic therapists in Canada, but it's much the same thing. And it's always been a very good team-based relationship, and so this is one of the things that I would have in common. He's also been extremely productive in the field of sport injury epidemiology, which is one of the things that uh, I have a great interest in as well. So not only am I honored to do this lecture, and I think I have a kinship with Dr. Garrett as well. So, 
I'm going to start by defining some of the terms in that title so that at least we're on the same page. And then I'm going to give you some individual examples to try and get you thinking about what I'm going to be talking about. I'll then talk about measuring outcomes, which is something that I've been doing for more than 20 years. Then give you some examples of system-based care, because I think this is critical to where we all are. And finally talk about how do we change the existing paradigm. Now many of you might think we don't need to do that, but hopefully I'll suggest we will. So patient-centered care, changing the paradigm and understanding outcomes and definitions. So what do I mean by patient-centered care to start off with? Well, first of all, the patient is always number one. I learned that from my father-in-law, who was a cardiac surgeon. And I think if we ever forget that, then we're missing the boat. If we put ourselves in front of our patients, then we're not going to be doing an optimal job. And I'm, I can tell from the interaction of the people around here that that's really the same objective in this institution. The next thing is centered. What do we mean by centered? Well, this is one of the definitions of being centered. So, bring to focus and bring together. And I think it's really important to appreciate that we are bringing together a bunch of people tonight. But if we want focused patient care or patient-centered care, it involves several people. And if we're not on the same page, then we cannot deliver patient-centered care, at least in my opinion. So it is not patient-centric care. When I draw the line, I think a lot of these terms can be used synonymously, but clearly patient-centric care has different components or definitions to it, such as dominant or master. And of course, this is Lance Armstrong, and we all know what he meant by patient-centric care and the aftermath of what has happened in these circumstances. So clearly this is not what we're talking about, not what we want to emulate, although it did lead to great success for the wrong reasons. So there are several definitions of patient-centered care. I apologize for those of you who realize that I might have typos, but I'm interchanging the British and the American spelling of center, for those of you who are paying attention. So this is one of the quotes of the definition. And so it's a widely used but poorly understood concept in medical practice. It may be most commonly understood for what it is not. So it is not technology-centered care. It's not doctor-centered care or even surgeon-centered care, which most of us who become orthopedic surgeons are fairly surgeon-centered, I would suggest. And then if we deal with hospitals, as I know you're all going to be dealing with, it's not hospital-centered care either, and it's certainly not disease-centered care. So the point about patient-centered care, and I'll read this out, is that patient-centered care seek to make the implicit in patient care explicit. And I've added here explicit to everyone so that everybody understands why we're doing this. And in particular, we must also empower the patient, because if we are taking an approach to the individual, and we're not putting them, we're putting them at the center, but we're not requiring them to do anything, it's not going to work either. So the patient has to be empowered to be part and parcel of their care. Now just to clarify, if we talk about different types of care, one of them would be diagnosis-based care, and I would argue that this is the standard medical model that we all grew up with in medical school, where our goal was to make a diagnosis, and then based upon that diagnosis, there was a defined treatment, and we would carry that out and we would expect there to be outcome. But we all know that you can have multiple different ways of managing the same disease, and multiple different outcomes from that disease. So if we follow a disease-based care model, we will be failing a lot of the patients along the way. If we 
look at practitioner-based care, and this is a fairly, from a surgeon's perspective, an egotistical way of doing it, or a more centric way of doing it, where I would say, well, I'm a surgeon, and I only want to see surgical patients. I want to operate as much as I possibly can so I can maximize my income, and I'm not too concerned about the other aspects of what goes on, and I can delegate that to somebody else. Well, that might be very good for me, it's not necessarily very good for the patients. And then we could put any practitioner in that boat, although surgeons are clearly the ones that take the brunt of that criticism or stereotype, if you will. We then consider population-based care, and I, and I would use the example of a third world country where we're dealing with diseases that we have far eliminated in North America. But clearly there's a role for a population-based approach, whether it's vaccinations or water treatment or otherwise. And then we're all inundated with hospital-based care, so hospital budgets, hospital HR issues. I think we've had a few of those here, maybe. I'll leave that alone. But because we operate, we work in hospitals, and so we're inevitably faced with those issues as well. And what about system-based care? So, could we say Obamacare here? Maybe, maybe not. But in Canada, it's really interesting that they identified five priorities for care. And one of them is hip and knee replacement, arthroplasty. And so from a federal perspective and from a provincial perspective, this is what the system is driving, and it takes priority over everything else. So everything that I do that has nothing to do with it, and the arthroplasty takes, I feel like I'm a second class citizen because the system is defining the priorities, not the patients, or not me, or not what is truly a need. If you happen to work in workers' compensation or in medical legal fields, then you will deal with disability care or liability care, and that's another area that deserves attention. And then because we're in this fantastic institution and building, then we have to consider athlete-based care. And I know that that's the focus of many of the people in this room, including myself. Now, I, I would argue that we should start thinking a little differently about our athlete-centered care. And we typically think, well, somebody's injured, let's get them back to play. But getting athletes back to play is, is fairly straightforward. Are we getting them back to play safely? And are they able to perform at a level that's consistent with what they expect, their coaches expect, and everybody else expects? So I don't think we've really defined return to performance the way we have return to play. We accept that as a reasonable outcome. Whereas if you're performing at a poor level, last time I checked, the coach isn't too keen on that. So the next part of the definition is change. And this is defined as an act or a process in which something becomes different. Very simple. But it's very stressful and very difficult. And I know a lot of changes are going along around here. And I've heard this over the last two days. And it challenges status quo thinking. And people say, well, you can't teach an old dog any tricks. But I think if we're going to embrace change, then we have to do that. And it requires a lot of reorganization and all sorts of other things. So in my relatively short 25 career, year career, I grew up with hospitals. We then had hospital districts. We then had the Calgary Regional Health Authority. We then had the Calgary Health Region. We then had Alberta Health Services. We were the Division of Orthopedic Surgery. We wanted to become a department, and now we're a section. And yet nothing has changed. And so one of my favorite quotes is this one here. We trained hard, but it seemed that every time we were beginning to form up into teams, we would be reorganized. I was to learn later in life that we tend to meet any new situation by reorganizing. And a wonderful method it can be for creating the illusion of progress while producing confusion, inefficiency, and demoralization. This is from 2010 BC. <laughs> Sound familiar? 
paradigm. Well, those of us who are educated in Oklahoma, paradigm ain't 20 cents. <laughs> It's a model or a pattern or a standard. So if we're going to change the paradigm, then we should be thinking about changing the model, the pattern, or the standard. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time on outcomes, but um, that's really the focus of this. If we don't understand outcomes, then it's really hard to change the paradigm and use that to our advantage. So an outcome is really anything that's measured. It can be subjective or objective. Typically, it would be the dependent variable that we would look at when we're doing research, so what we're looking to see if we can change through our treatment options. And in the more modern sense, an outcome is, in other words, would be an index or a measure, a tool, a questionnaire, or something or an instrument. So that's the context that we're talking about in outcomes. So we have to be willing to change the way we think about things in the perspective. So it reminds me of a story, and some of you may have heard this story before. So this fellow here is walking his dog on a beautiful Seattle days, typical to what we've had in the last few days that I've been here, apparently for most of the summer. And he's walking through the campus of the University of Washington and he's sweating, he's getting very thirsty, and he sees a bar, right, or just over here, I went by a few of them the other day. And so he figures, well, I'm gonna go in the bar and get myself a beer. I think Bruce is probably there already with it. Thanks, So he walks into the bar with his dog, and sits down and orders a beer. No sooner have you sat down and ordered the beer, the manager comes running up to him and says, What the hell are you doing in my bar? This is a high class joint. We don't allow animals or pets or anything of that nature in this bar. This is just not acceptable. Well, he was very thirsty. He was a very, very bright fellow, educated at the University of Washington. And so he was thinking on his feet, and he said, well, this is a seeing-eye dog. And of course, the manager was quite apologetic, and he gave him a beer on the house and two or three more. So off he goes, very satisfied, and, he's, and his thirst is now quenched, and off he goes out of the bar back into the park. And as he's approaching the park, he sees this young woman, She's walking her dog. And uh, she says, oh, I just noticed she came out of that bar. Says, oh, yes, yes, I was in there, I had a few beers. And she said, oh, I didn't realize they let dogs in that bar. I said, oh, well, they don't. But I told them this was a CNI dog. So she's sweating, she's a bit thirsty, and she figures I'm going for a beer, too. So she pulls her sunglasses out of her purse, she puts them on, and walks into the bar. And no sooner than she sat down, the manager comes in, and he thinks this is a, now a, a, a frequent occurrence in his bar. People are walking in with pets. He comes running up to him and says, what the hell are you doing in my bar? This is a high-class bar. You don't allow pets and animals in this bar. And she's got her sunglasses on, and she says, well, this is a seeing eye dog. The manager looks at him, see my dog, that's it. See my dogs are German shepherds, golden retrievers, or, uh, I don't know, something like this, but you have a chihuahua. And she says, well, she looks down. So you have to change your perspective if you're going to think about using outcomes to, to change the paradigm of healthcare and make it patient-centered. So now I'm going to give you a few examples to try and bring this to the forefront of what many of you might treat in this room. So Surgeon X is on call. I know there are a few residents here. I know this is a major trauma center. And somebody comes in with a broken tibia, 
And the surgeon decides to do an anatomical reduction, an open internal fixation with a plate, and presents this beautiful x-ray at rounds on Friday or the next Monday, I think the rounds are here. And one of the smart R5s puts up their hand and says, well, why didn't you use an IM nail for this fracture? And the surgeon said, well, this is what I've always done. And it works. It's my preferred technique. And in fact, the surgeon is epidemiologically trained, follows critical appraisal techniques, and says, well, here's the article, and this is the evidence-based approach that I use. And I'll leave that with you, and we'll come back to that example. The next example is a water skier. I'm sure you have a lot of water skiers around here. Who ruptures his hamstring. And one of the sport docs decides to do an ultrasound. This is Canada, and we can't afford MRIs on everybody. And the ultrasound shows that he's ruptured his tendon, but there's probably still some tendon intact. So he's treated non-surgically and life goes on. It turns out that there is some evidence that he should be treated surgically. But nevertheless, he's treated non-surgically. And with the typical delays in our system, they don't get in to see a surgeon for two or three months. So it's really too late to worry about it at that point anyway. The next example might be a little more shocking. is a 17-year-old male who's playing football. Has the standard history, pop, tear, rip, pain, immediate swelling and tears his ACL, and this is confirmed on the MRI, and he's treated non-surgically. And there's evidence to support the non-surgical treatment out of Scandinavia, a randomized trial, that would suggest that this is an appropriate way to treat this individual. And I'm sure most of the people in this room, including myself, would disagree with that. Nevertheless, that's the way he was treated. The fourth example is a 60-year-old male with a documented full thickness, three centimeter cuff tear who is referred for surgical treatment and undergoes an arthroscopic mini open rotator cuff repair and at two years has a quality of life score of 85 out of 100 and is doing extremely well. And again, there's a randomized trial to support that treatment also. So this is what we would consider to be evidence-based care these four examples. At least there is some evidence to support caring for these patients in that way. So let's talk more about outcomes so that we have a real good understanding of what it means to measure outcomes. So as I said before, this is just anything that you can measure. But in the current context, really what we're talking about is either clinician-based outcomes or patient-reported outcomes. So a clinician-based outcome is based upon the fundamental assumption that physiological outcomes and patient well-being are highly correlated. The truth is that that's not actually the case in many circumstances. So if you look at joint space narrowing on a knee x-ray, then or the size of a rotator cuff tear, or the side-to-side -side difference in a KT arthrometer, which would be considered clinician-based, objective ways of assessing patients. They don't actually correlate with the health status of the patient, at least not consistently they don't. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. It is absolutely not a consistent pattern. Therefore, we measure patient-reported outcomes, and the strictest definition of that is anything that the patient gives to you and a patient-reported outcome or a probe is something that is not interpreted by a clinician. It is what it is, and we accept it for what it is. And we report it that way and measure it that way. So the FDA, when it comes to assessing treatments and treatments, uses, thinks that patient-reported outcomes are important, and they are aware that some treatment effects are known only to the patient. So if you measure something objectively, it has no bearing on the patient. And they feel that it is important to understand the patient's perspective if they're going to ratify a new drug or a new surgical treatment or something else. And they believe that 
a systematic assessment of the patient's perspective would provide valuable information, and that that perspective is filtered through a clinician's eyes may be different. So it's pretty clear that in the modern context, people appreciate that what a patient will tell us is different than what we may measure some other way. Now it turns out that there are no accepted rules or standards when it comes to a patient-reported outcome. And people go around pontificating that something is validated or not validated or used this way or not that way. And, but there is a recognized methodology for developing these outcomes. And it's very clear and it's fairly new. So for those of you in the audience who have been around a lot longer than I have, that's no disrespect because the, this is new. And people would suggest that quality of life is a more important attribute to measure than the absence of deformity of disease, particularly when it comes to orthopedic problems, and particularly in a first world country where we don't have as much disease and deformity in the world in a third world country. So I've been involved in developing several patient-reported outcomes over the years, and these are examples of that. And I take it a step further. And the further step is that we can have something that is reported by the patient, but if it is not patient-based, it might not actually be relevant. And therefore, just because it's reported by the patient doesn't necessarily make it valid. So, most of us are forced to do surveys from time to time. And one of my biggest pet peeves about doing a survey is they don't have the answer that I really want to give. And that's because it's not consumer-based. Somebody wants to get information, and they're driving an agenda, and they don't allow you to input what you really want to say. So they can go and report the results of the survey with statistical accuracy beyond an election in Miami or Florida. And it's considered the truth, where in fact, most of us might actually want to say something different, but we're not allowed to. So the critical step in developing an outcome, in my opinion, is to make sure that everything that is relevant to that patient population is identified at the start. And so, when I developed the ACL Quality of Life Questionnaire, we had 167 separate items that were gleaned from evaluating the literature and in particular talking to patients. So we kept talking to patients until we surveyed them to redundancy. In other words, it didn't matter how many more people we talked to, we didn't get any more new, unique items to look at. And we did the same thing when we developed our hip outcome questionnaire, and we got a total of 147 items. So at least at that point, I could say that we had captured everything that was important to patients. Now, it turns out that if we don't do that, there's a huge discrepancy. So we published this paper where we asked the surgeons to rate the same 167 items. And it turns out that what the patients rated as important and what the surgeons rated as important were completely different. And the surgeons' ratings were much higher than the patients' ratings. So the surgeon would say, this item is a 4.8 out of 5 on a liquor scale. And the patient would say, well, that's only a 2.8. So not only are the things that patients look at different, we rate them differently as well. And so, one of the questions on our hip outcome questionnaire is the following. How much trouble do you have with sexual activity because of your hip? Now, I would stand up here and admit that for somebody in my mid-50s, it's very difficult for me to ask a 40-year-old female patient without a, somebody else in the room, are you having trouble with sexual activity because of your hip? And I suspect many people might be in the same boat. Turns out that, this is sort of an embarrassing anecdote, but there was a girl that I met when I was in medical school, and she was in nursing school. And I asked her out on a date. 
Thirty years later, she walked into my examining room where they got from <laughs> Those of you who have uh, sinister minds, I didn't have a sexual activity, but Bruce. <laughs> but she was in tears. And the reason she was in tears is because she said, I didn't ask her directly, it was the outcome of it, which was a questionnaire that was computer based. She said to me, You're the first person who ever asked me that question. And it turns out that women. It's a very important thing for women with hip problems, much more so than men. So if we don't identify that and we don't measure it, then we're not really measuring what is important to patients. And that's a very, very, maybe, difficult example of why this is important. So we measure outcomes differently when we do them on the computer in a non-threatening environment than if we ask the question. And we would ask the questions differently if we asked them. And more often than not, what patients think is a good outcome is something we would think might be excellent. We rate patients higher than they rate themselves, in other words. So next, I wanted to give a few examples of system-based care. So as I alluded to before, Internationally, hip and knee arthroplasty is one of the benchmarks that is measured in all the industrialized nations around the world, the so-called OECD countries. So in Canada, because we value our health care, we consider it a right, um, the federal and provincial governments and all of our hospitals have prioritized hip and knee arthroplasty to the exclusion of everybody else. And so when Canada's biggest issue with healthcare, other than the cost, is access to care. And we're, we rate much lower in those, those countries than most other countries. So they specifically introduced more resources, dollars, operating room time, access for surgeons and patients to have their hip and knees replaced, not shoulders, by the way. Excluded shoulders, interestingly. Well, this is a great incentive for a surgeon because we are fee for service. So if we have more operating time, more resources, we can make more money. So guess what? A lot of the surgeons who are doing general orthopedics just started doing it in the arthroplasty. Shocking, isn't it? And they were also provided, in addition to these resources, administrative and personnel support. So their job was made easier. So this is a system-based example of how to deliver care. So in Calgary now, you can go and see the first available surgeon if you want, and you can get in right away to get your hip and knee replaced. There are standardized care pathways in the hospital, and these are well documented, and, and patients, when they come out of hospital, are followed by non-surgeons. And we still don't have long-term outcomes on this new system-developed care to decide whether it's better than what we were doing before. Now, it appears that it is, but we don't really know. So because of this system-based initiative, and wait times in some provinces, and now provinces in Canada have met the benchmarks that were set ahead of time, the length of hospital stay has come down dramatically but we still don't have full outcome data to say that we're actually making differences to patients. The implication is that we are, but we're not sure yet. So we still have to collect that. We started a national joint registry, and the trouble is it's not full. So I don't know what the, the adherence to putting in the data is, but it might only be 40 or 60 percent of the patients. So at the end of the day, what have we really gained from changing the system? So it's a bit, a bit demoralizing. So 14 years ago, I had the idea because we have really poor access for our knee injury patient on the whole. We did some database research that showed us that the average time from injury to ACL reconstruction, you would like to hazard a guess what that might be. So we looked at all the people that had an ACL reconstruction according to our computer database throughout the province. 
and then looked backwards in time and said, when was the first time we entered the system with a knee injury? And then we got rid of all of the information that didn't make any sense, and we measured that time on average. So this is just somebody that ended up having an ACL reconstruction. Anybody want to hazard a guess as to how long that was? 18 months, I heard. 24 months, I heard. Six. Four years. Four years. And only 3% of Albertans were getting their ACL reconstructed within the first three months of injury. And this isn't including the people who were not operated on. This is only the people that had surgery. So this is shocking. Now we could argue that that's good, bad, or indifferent, and there's evidence to support one way or the other, but it's certainly shocking. shocking. So as a result of this, we decided to develop a web-based screening and diagnostic questionnaire that was based upon some research out of Britain. And we now allow patients to access our clinic directly, without a referral, without a physician, without any. They just log in, they punch the information into the computer. If they are deemed eligible and are only dealing with acute knee injuries, and people lie, by the way, so it's not perfect. And the information goes directly into our EMR, so we were talking about that earlier. Then I trained some non-physicians who happen to be athletic therapists at the level of an orthopedic resident. So I used all of the parameters that we use in the residency program, set the standard extremely high, trained people, and they work in a team with a sport medicine physician and see all of these patients. And we then did the research, so we did an efficacy project to find out can we do it. And it turns out that we got some peer review funding. We developed another outcome measure to measure the effect of this new delivery care model. And then we had government provide us with some funding for the first year to see if we could see if we could do it now in real life. So this is more of an effectiveness pro project. So for those non-epidemiologists in the audience, those are two very distinct terms, even though most, with all due respect, clinicians use them synonymously, they are not when we're talking clinical epidemiology. So what we found was patient satisfaction is much higher. Access times are much lower, this is a no-brainer. We had less visits to get definitive care. For the patients that required surgery, 100% of those patients who were referred had surgery, 100%. No mistakes. And we utilized MRIs much less. So that sounds very good when you're doing research and you know there's people doing all these things. But the question is, can we reproduce that? So in 2012, and these are our statistics. We screened 3,513 patients online. We saw 1,842 new knee-injured patients, and they had a total of 3,323 3, visits. MRI was utilized six percent of the time. So this clinic is driven on the cost reduction of not doing MRIs. I was saying earlier, an MRI in Alberta costs the taxpayer $540 a pop. Now, I can tell you, it's not in this information, that that's not high enough. We're undershooting MRI and we've created a bias to not do MRIs and we make an occasional mistake by not doing an MRI. So probably we should be in the 10% range or maybe as high as 15%. But we certainly don't need it higher than that. We address quality control with, with regular peer review sessions and these are a iterative process to re-educate the people who are working in the clinic. So is this patient-centered? Well, we believe it is. It's direct access for patients who otherwise wouldn't have access to care. Or they go and wait in the emergency room or worse. We're delivering a specialist standard of care at the primary level, so at the first introduction into the healthcare system. It's quicker access and it is evidence-based because we have the research to support it. 
So I would argue that this is patient-centered care. Now what I don't have on the slide is what happens to those patients down the road. And it's all very well to see them assess them, but if they're getting injured six weeks later, then we haven't done a very good job. Now I just want to give you another example of how outcomes change the paradigm of what we believe. So we've just finished a trial where we randomized 330 patients into three different ACL reconstruction techniques. And I have to acknowledge somebody whenever I present this information. And I was presenting my proposal at one of our monthly research rounds. And one of the research assistants put up her hand, and I presented this. She said, well, why don't you blind to the patients? I said, you can't blind patients. We're doing hamstring reconstructions, we tell tendon reconstructions, and blew her off. You know, dismissed her. Typical orthopedic surgeon. What the hell do you know? And as I normally do, I go home, and then my wife gives me a reality check. And I, and I woke up in the middle of the night, and I said, she's absolutely right. If we really want to identify what the hell is going on here, then we have to blind the patients. We have to eliminate that bias. And so all of the patients were blinded to the technique. Everybody had identical incisions. And nobody knew other than me, and I've got a bad memory, so I forget very quickly. And then my assessor was blinded as well, was not allowed to identify what the technique was. And then we very systematically looked at their complication rates. And I think that if I asked a survey in this room, everybody would say that if we do a patellar tendon reconstruction, people are more likely to have anterior knee pain. I think that's a commonly held belief in ACL circles. And it turns out in that Cochrane review that Carol talked about, that's what we found. And here are the results. Everybody had knee pain before surgery. And for some reason, the randomization didn't equalize the groups. And at the end of two years, patellar tendons had more knee pain, statistically significantly. But it went down from what it was preoperatively. So not only do we have to measure these outcomes, we have to measure them properly, and we have to measure them in an unbiased fashion. I can't really explain this, except that maybe what we're doing is mucking around more when we Double bundle reconstruction or cutting out my nerve fibers. I don't know. But they all had the same incisions. Now let's go back to our example and then I'll finish up. So this person had a, a plate put on their tibia. But what if the person was a downhill skier? Doesn't that mean that this person is at risk for a boot top fracture right about there? And therefore, wouldn't we feel obligated to take the plate out? And if they're a competitive downhill skier and you take the plate out, don't they miss the season that the plates come out in because they've got holes in their tibia? So if we're following a patient-centered approach, and in this example, an evidence-based approach was followed, then we would consider there an IM male for a competitive downhill skier, potentially, rather than a plate. Even though the evidence shows that the plate is probably better at maintaining the anatomical position of the tibia. What about example two? Well, I tell everybody with these hamstring injuries that if they're a sprinter, they become a runner. So they're going to lose that extra year. If they're a runner, they become a jogger. If they're a jogger, they become a walker. Well, those of you who are familiar with these injuries, is if, if that's the picture, they've ripped everything off, probably. It's not just one tendon. So the ultrasound isn't the best investigation. They probably should all have an MRI. But by the time I saw this guy, it was already two months. We're already recovering, he's already walking around, and now I tell him I'm going to operate on you, and I'll stick you in a brace and crutches for the next two months, but I don't think so. So they'll accept the outcome that maybe is less than I could have potentially offered with an operation. So we really didn't give him a very good patient-centered approach. What about our 17-year-old ACL? Well, this guy was seen in six months. I saw him about two or three weeks ago. And according to the patient reported outcome, first of all, he had, there was no change in his lax. His exam was identical. He had no pain in his knee, no effusion whatsoever. And he was scoring 97 out of 100 in six months. 
Well, the best I can do with an operation is 60 out of 100 on that questionnaire in six months. So I can't actually make this guy better, even if I are better. I can change his laxity. I can put a scar on his knee. I can, I can violate one of his tendons. But I can't actually make him better from his perspective. So I, I didn't do it. And the final example here is, well, this person was scoring 85 out of 100 on, on this validated questionnaire that we have, and we have a trial to support that. And we now have newer information. If he started off at 50 out of 100, he didn't need an operation at all. This score is actually, this outcome score is predictive of function and outcome in two years. Now, what's the proviso? Patient-centered, empowered care, high adherence to the rehab program. So the people in this study were doing home-based exercises six days a week religiously for three months. Well, how many in the room have dismissed failure of non-surgical care long before that? I know I have. And so the, the real learning lesson from this study is Maybe if we really get patients to adhere to their rehab, then we can increase the benefit of non-surgical care dramatically and in a rotator cuff. That is absolutely the case. And this type of information is being reproduced by the group, the uh, Moon Group, I guess it is. Okay, what about our professional athlete? So here's our, our guy, um, Adrian Peterson. This is Joel Boyd, one of our friends and colleagues. And this is remarkable how somebody can go through this operation and in less than a year not only get back to play, but perform at a higher level than ever before. Now, is that patient centered care? You bet it is. But it also involves a huge amount of resource. Did we empower him to get better? Absolutely. We gave him millions of dollars to play football. I didn't, but somebody did. And he's highly motivated. So you couldn't give a better model to get back to this level. It doesn't always work, though. What about this guy? I remember last spring going to meetings and people said, oh, you know, Derek Rose hasn't got back playing basketball. What's wrong with him? There's nothing wrong with him. He just happens to be a normal human being and tore his ACL. Because if you really look critically at how people do after ACL surgery, the results are very clear. Most people do not get back to the same level of activity. And this is worldwide. And certainly they don't get back in the first year. I and mean, even Jimmy Andrews is quoted in the paper as saying that most athletes don't perform as well until their second season back. So this is the norm. And Peterson is abnormal. So we can't be going around pontificating and talking about this kind of outcome when the reality is this kind of outcome or worse. What about our, our varsity athletes here? What about our high school athletes? Do they have the resources and the motivation and the contract to do as well? I don't think so. Well, what's next? What about this guy? Revision surgery. Can you imagine? He's supposed to be playing in two weeks. I don't know. Is that the right thing to do? Is that the best thing for him as a patient? It might be at this point in time when we know that in the elite athlete world, and particularly in professional athletes, they are willing to sacrifice their future for what they're doing today. That's why people take performance enhancing drugs. It's very simple. They don't care. And this is universal throughout the world, every sport. So it may be that he's willing to sacrifice that knee and end up gimping around at the age of 40. I don't know. We'll find out. I would suspect that he's not going to be performing as well this season as he did last year. So how do we change the existing paradigm? Well, I think there's a worldwide healthcare crisis, and whether we have to deal with populations in the third world, whether it's Obamacare for the Republicans in the room who don't adhere to this. I guess Seattle isn't a Republican. We may have this discussion down at the Sedman Hawkins Clinic. It's pretty one-sided. I think change is inevitable. I think we have to embrace change and we should be part of the solution, otherwise we're part of the problem. One other thing about measuring outcomes, we have to acknowledge our own biases and we all have them. 
And, and in the research world, I think to me, a pure researcher is somebody who believes in the question more than the outcome. So that trial I talked about, people are saying, well, what are you trying to show? I said, what do you mean? I said, well, what are you trying to show? What's your favorite best technique? I said, I don't care. That's not what's important. What's important is to define if one is better than the other. Because it didn't matter to me which technique was best. Um, but that's not the way most people approach things. We have these biases and we have to eliminate them if we're really, really going to find out what's important. And we have to engage the patient. We have to, people say this questionnaire is too long. Well, it's not too long if the questions are important to the patient. So if we've created the questionnaire properly, then everything should be important to the patient. And so to sit down for 10 or 15 minutes and fill in a 34 item questionnaire is nothing. For a patient, for you and I, it would be a pain in the butt. It's not relevant to us. So we think it shouldn't be relevant to the patients. And then you have to take that outcome measure and you have to discuss it with the patient. You can't have them fill in all these reams and reams of things and then go in the examining room and say, where's your pain? and examine them and book them for an operation. You have to acknowledge that they have filled in that information because it's relevant to them. And I think we're really using outcomes and we're thinking about patient-centered care. We also have to understand the answers. There are people that come in and they score zero out of 100. Right? That worries me. These things are not perfect. Zero out of 100 doesn't make sense. Nobody's zero. You walk in and you're zero out of 100 while well, you're living for crying out loud. <laughs> So we have to keep the information in context and not take it out of context, otherwise we're misleading people. So you can trust the answers of these patient-reported outcomes in the majority of patients. And I firmly believe that this leads to a better understanding of the truth, because we really should be after the truth, not just trying to provide evidence to formulate the opinion that we've already brought into the room and our own biases. So understanding things from the patient's perspective is more likely to allow us to have a patient-centered approach. And we need to do this better. We need to empower our patients. We need to find out what makes an Adrian Peterson tick. Because if we can model that and inject it into somebody, it's like happy people. Happy people are wonderful to be around. I need to find out what's in your PPP and inject it into myself sometimes. And sometimes I'm a little grumpy. So engage the patients from the start, and we'll be able to change this paradigm, and hopefully patient-centered care will be part of what we all do. I'd like to thank you for your attention.
years of jobs and things, the neighboring district would be seeing that what we should have a school for, which should be a G1 too. Well, that's one of the commonest questions that is asked, because everybody wants the, the easy route. And the answer is, don't worry about the uncommon things. Because nobody in their right mind would spend two years developing an outcome measure to assess patients with hamstring ruptures. Because it's not a very common injury. And so, I, I, I think you can use, it turns out you can use proxies. So the ACL questionnaire works pretty well for PCLs. It's not perfect, but it works pretty well. And et cetera. But I, I would focus on the things that you do most commonly and address those the best way you can. And accept the fact that there will be a little bit of crossover into other disease states. And then, and then for the purposes of generic patients coming in, use joint-specific rather than disease-specific outcomes, because that gives you a global picture of what's going on. So the simple shoulder test, for example, or the Oxford shoulder score, are shoulder-specific questionnaires, just as the hip one is a hip-specific questionnaire rather than a disease-specific questionnaire. So I think the more sophisticated outcome you're using, so in the hip one, we developed an IHOP 33, and an IHOP 12. That's because people are asking this question. And we use the IHOP 33 if we're going to do a randomized clinical trial. We use the IHOP 12 if we want to follow day-to-day -day patients because it turns out that 12 questions is kind of a nice number, I think. Sorry, Sorry, multi-dimensional concept that addresses all sorts of things. 
only one of those dimensions is the outcome of the patient. The other things are, do I have to pay for parking? How long do I wait in the waiting room? Do I like the appearance of my physician? Were they really nice to me and all those things? So if you're really talking about patient satisfaction, that's a, that's a whole different multi-dimensional concept that is different than assessing quality of life as an outcome, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you're absolutely right. Again, it's different. So you had the years of watching the department of the case, and you said, bless the
Hodman who started all of this, as, as you well know, in the 1920s at the Massachusetts Medical Society, and he was booted out of the room for suggesting that surgeons should find out how their patients were doing. He was ostracized. And didn't he pass away as a pauper or something? And when he wasn't, yeah. So. So as much as we think this is new, it's, it goes back a long time, and uh, I think people are more accepting of that today.